Today is day two for the Come Follow Me readings for this week, April 17th through the 23rd, Matthew 18 and Luke 10. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Tuesday, April 18th, 2023, Matthew 18, 6 through 20. Offenses in Galilee. Luke 9, 49 through 50, and John spake and said, Master, he saw, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid not any, for he who is not against us is for us. Mark nine thirty eight through 42 And John spake unto him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. Some people have wondered how to reconcile the Savior's statement, he that is not against us is on our part, with his statement, he that is not with me is against me. These sayings can be understood by examining the context in which each was made. In the situation recorded in Matthew 12, the Pharisees said that the Savior cast out devils by the power of the devil. The Savior declared that he cast out devils by the power of God, and that the Pharisees could not take a neutral position concerning him. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. The situation recorded in Mark 9, 38-40 was different. Instead of Pharisees expressing their lack of belief in Jesus' power, a man who clearly believed in Jesus was casting out devils. However, the Apostle John expressed concern about the man. Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not with us, and he followeth not us, and we forbade him, because he followeth not us. Elder Bruce and McConkie suggested reasons for John's concern by explaining that the man was not one of the inner circle of disciples who traveled, ate, slept, and communed continually with the Master. Luke has it, he followed not with us. That is, he is not one of our traveling companions, but with, but from our Lord's reply, it is evident that he was a member of the kingdom, a legal administrator who was acting in the authority of the priesthood and the power of faith. Either he was unknown to John, who therefore erroneously supposed him to be without authority, or else John falsely supposed that the power to cast out devils was limited to the twelve and did not extend to all faithful priesthood holders. It is quite possible that one, that the one casting out devils was a 70. The Savior's answer to John, recorded in Mark 9, 40, reassured John that the 12, that the man, reassured John and the 12, that the man was a disciple with authority, though not an apostle. And whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. Matthew eighteen six through 11 But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Though Jesus was speaking to leaders of his day when he issued a stern warning not to offend little ones, the message recorded in Matthew 18, 5-10 applies to all of us. Behold, ye are little children, and ye cannot bear all things now. Ye must grow in grace and in in the knowledge of the truth. The Lord said that the elders of the church were like little children in their knowledge of the gospel, but he promised that if they received him, they would grow in grace and in the knowledge of the truth, and would someday become one with the Father and the Son. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles reminded the saints to not become discouraged with slow spiritual growth. Paced progress not only is acceptable to the Lord, but also is recommended by him. Divine declarations say, Ye are little children, and ye cannot bear all things now. I will lead you along. Just as divine disclosure usually occurs, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, so likewise we will achieve our spiritual progress gradually. 
rather than seeing ourselves as failing simply because we do not become immediately perfect, such as in the attribute of mercy, we should seek to become ever more merciful in the process of time. Even amid diligence, there need not be unrealistic expectations. Though imperfect, are an, imp an improving person can actually know that the course of his life is generally accepted to the Lord despite there being much distance yet to be covered. Fear not, little children, for you are mine, and I have overcome the world, and you are of them that my Father hath given me. We must not cause anyone seeking greater understanding of the gospel plan to stumble in their faith, nor should we do anything to block their progress toward eternal life. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught about this warning. Few crimes are as gross and wicked as that of teaching false doctrine and leading souls away from God and salvation. If eternal joy is the reward given to those who teach the truth and bring souls to salvation, shall not those who teach false doctrines and lead souls to damnation receive as their reward eternal remorse? It is better to die and be denied the blessings of continued mortal existence than to live and lead souls from the truth, thereby gaining eternal damnation for oneself. If effective leaders repent of their wrongdoing, woe unto the world because of offenses, for it, it, for it must be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, it is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into eternal fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. And a man's hand is his friend, and his foot also. And a man's eyes are they of his own household. Mark nine thirty. 43 through 50. Therefore, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Or if thy brother offend thee, and confess not, and forsake not, he shall be cut off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. For it is better for thee to enter into life without thy brother than for thee to, for thee and thy brother to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where thy where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And again, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. For he that is thy standard, by whom thou walkest, if he becometh a transgressor, he shall be cut off. It is better for thee to even halt into life, than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Therefore, let every man stand or fall by himself, and not for another, or not trusting another. Seeking unto, seek unto my Father, and it shall be done in that very moment, that ye shall ask, if ye ask in faith, believing that ye shall receive. And if thine eye, which seeth for thee, him that is appointed to watch over thee, to shew thee light, become a transgressor, and offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God one eye, with one eye, than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. For it is better that thyself should be saved, than to be cast into hell with thy brother, where thy worm dieth not, and where the fire is not quenched. In Mark nine forty two to forty eight, offend comes from the Greek word scandal meaning to put a stumbling block or impediment in the way or to cause to sin. By teaching that if our hand, foot, or brother offend us, we should cut it off. The Savior was teaching that we must eliminate from our lives any association or influence, no matter how dear. That would keep us from entering into the kingdom of God. Elder Walter F. Gonzalez of the Presidency of the Seventy quoted from the Joseph Smith translation of these verses as he taught what it means to cut off unworthy influences in our lives. The Savior said, Therefore, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off, or if thy brother offend thee, and confess not and forsake not, he shall be cut off. 
Fortunately, the Savior himself taught the meaning of cutting off our hand. It's not about self-mutilation, but rather about removing from our lives today those influences that keep us from preparing for tomorrow's times of adversity. If I have friends who are bad influences for me, <clears throat> the advice is clear. It is better for thee to enter into life without thy brother than for thee and thy brother to be cast into hell. The Lord applied this same principle when warning Nephi to depart from his brethren who become a dangerous influence. It follows that such cutting off refers not only to friends, but to every bad influence, such as inappropriate television shows, internet sites, movies, literature, games, and music. Engraving in our souls, this principle will help us to resist the temptation to yield to any bad influence. For, ver for every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. As recorded in Mark 9, 43-48, the Savior em emphasized that followers of Jesus Christ must be willing to sacrifice unworthy aspects of their lives, represented by their hands, feet, or eyes, in order to enter the kingdom. As recorded in Mark 9, 49, the Savior then spoke of the entire person as a sacrifice to God. Sacrifices in ancient Israel were made with salt and with fire. Salt was an important symbol of the covenant between the Lord and Israel, and fire was often a symbol of spiritual preservation, purification, trials, and complete dedication to God. <clears throat> Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained that Mark 9.49 teaches that every member of the church shall be tested and tried in all things to see whether he will abide in the covenant, even unto death. But the salt must be good, for if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Therefore it must needs be that ye have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Effective leaders are mindful of children. Take heed that ye despise not one of the, these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. <clears throat> Effective leaders seek out those who are lost. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost and to call sinners to repentance, but these little ones have no need of repentance, and I will save them. In this verse, how did Jesus Christ summarize the purpose of his mortal ministry? Elder Dale G. Renland said, The Savior's mortal ministry was indeed characterized by love, compassion, and empathy. <laughs> he did not disdainfully walk the dusty roads of Galilee and Judea, flinching at the sight of sinners. He did not dodge them in abhorrent, abject horror. No, he ate with them. He helped and blessed, lifted and edified, and replaced fear and despair with hope and joy. Like the true shepherd he is, he seeks us and finds us to offer relief and hope. Understanding his compassion and love helps us under, helps us exercise faith in him to repent and to be healed. How do you see the Savior continuing to carry out that ministry today? How can you, as one of his disciples, participate in the continuing mission of the Savior? Is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven.
And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. Forbid him not. For there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Matthew eighteen twelve through 15 How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which ha which is gone astray? And if so be, and if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more over that which was lost, than over the ninety and nine which went not astray. <clears throat> Who is represented by the sheep that went astray in Matthew eighteen twenty uh, Matthew eighteen twelve and thirteen? Isaiah explained, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Therefore the lost sheep that needs to be rescued by the good shepherd represents every one of us. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. One of the truths we can learn from these verses is that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are compassionate and desire to save those who are spiritually lost. <clears throat> President Dieter Epigdorf, then of the First Presidency, explained over the centuries that this parable of the lost sheep was traditionally has traditionally been interpreted as a call to action for those to bring back the lost sheep and to reach out to those who are lost. While this is certainly appropriate and good, I wonder if there is more to it. It is possible that Jesus' purpose, first and foremost, was to teach about the work of the Good Shepherd. <clears throat> is it possible that he was testifying of God's love for his wayward children? It matters not how you become lost, whether because of your own poor choices or because of circumstances beyond your control. Because he loves you, he will find you. He will place you upon his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he brings you home, he will say to one and all, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep, which was lost. Why do you think Jesus Christ wants us to know how compassionate he and our Heavenly Father are? How can understanding their compassionate nature help you with your life circumstances right now? How does Heavenly Father feel about those who are trying to follow him, but who fall again and again? President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, then of the First Presidency, helped answer this question. We have all seen a toddler learn to walk. He takes a small step and totters. 
He falls. Do we scold such an attempt? Of course not. What father would punish a toddler for stumbling? We encourage, we applaud, and we praise because with every small step the child is becoming more like his parents. Now, brethren, compared to the perfect to the perfection of God, we mortals are scarcely more than awkward, faltering toddlers. But our loving Heavenly Father wants us to become more like Him, and dear brethren, that should be our eternal goal too. God understands that we get there not by not in an instant, but by taking one step at a time. I do not believe in a God who would set up rules and commandments only to wait for us to fail so He could punish us. I believe in a Heavenly Father who is loving and caring and who rejoices in our every effort to stand tall and walk toward Him. <clears throat> Even when he, we stumble, He urges us not to be discouraged, never to give up or flee our allotted field of service, but to take courage, find our faith, and keep trying. Since God is so loving, do we really need to strive to keep His commandments to be saved? President Dallin H. Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency taught some seem to value God's love because of their hope that He loves, that His love is so great and so unconditional that it will mercifully excuse them from obeying His laws. If a person understands the teachings of Jesus, he or she cannot reasonably conclude that our loving Heavenly Father or his divine son believes that their love supersedes their commandments. Jesus taught, Not only, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Effective leaders handle the trespasses of others sensitively and discreetly. <clears throat> Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall Hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. How can we apply this counsel in Matthew 18.15 to our family interactions? How would doing this bless our family? Matthew 18.16-20 But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. The Savior's teachings in Matthew 18, 15-20 refer to the law of witnesses. The foundation of this law, which required that two or three witnesses establish or decide certain matters, was set forth in Deuteronomy 19, 15. The Savior's teachings also establish a pattern of keys of authority being, first, being given first to Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, and then later to all the apostles. This pattern was followed in our day when the keys of the kingdom were given first to Joseph Smith and then later to the twelve apostles. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Is it necessary to discuss one's transgression with church leaders? The function of proper church leaders is in the matter of forgiveness is twofold. One, to exact proper penalty, for example, to initiate, initiate official action in regard to the sinner in cases which warrant either disfellowshipment or excommunication. Two, to waive penalties and extend the hand of fellowship to the one who in transgression. Whichever of the two steps is taken, either forgiveness or church disciplinary action, it must be done in the light of all the facts and the inspiration which can come to those making the decision. Hence the importance of the repentant transgressor in making full confession to the appropriate authority. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Effective leaders are unified and seek the Lord's assistance in their work. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, that they may not ask amiss, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Bishop Gerald Cosse said, Sometimes we talk about going to church, but the church is more than a building or a particular place. It is just as real and alive in the humblest of dwellings in the most remote areas of the world, as it is here at church headquarters in Salt Lake City, the Lord himself said, 
for where two or three are gathered together in my name, here am I in the midst of them. We take the church with us wherever we go, to work, to school, on vacation, and especially in our homes. <clears throat> our very presence and influence can be enough to make wherever we find ourselves a holy place. 